These are still unprecedented and momentous days. And I want to give an invitation, <clears throat> not only to everybody here in this room, but to everybody that's watching me. I want as many as can possibly be here to come join with us and uh, we still have plenty of room here and we want to be together as much as we possibly can. Now today is going to be <clears throat> the last in this series, America in Crisis. Today's title is Reflections. We've based this whole series on two passages of Scripture, Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. And then Psalms 33.12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. We've tried to say to you that America is in crisis politically because America is in crisis spiritually. We've also tried to say that America's hope is not in a political party or in a particular candidate, but America's only hope is in God. We can have the opportunity and the privilege to disagree politically, but we must love unconditionally. We try to say to you that there is a myth that is prevalent, and that myth is the separation of church and state. And we've encouraged you to check out on the website wallbuilders.com, a ministry founded and presided over by David Barton. We've also tried to say to you that legislation is a matter of spirituality because you either legislate good morality or you legislate bad morality. We've tried to say to you that the righteousness that will exalt a nation is found in the promotion of life from the womb to the tomb. We believe that. That's not a political statement. It's a biblical statement. It's a spiritual statement. We've tried to say that the righteousness that will exalt a nation is the promotion of purity, heart, mind, and body. God created mankind male and female. They are to stay that way. We promote biblical marriage as purity, one man, one woman, till death. We promote biblical justice, and we'll repeat this verse again, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We do not promote social justice, we promote biblical justice. And because we promote biblical justice, which is the righteousness that will exalt any nation, we disavow and reject violence, whether the violence is on the left or on the right or anywhere else. We are promoters of the law keepers that are our first responders and our police and firefighters. We promote biblical justice. We reject the 1619 Project that teaches that America was founded in 1619, not 1776, and was promoted and founded only to protect slavery when really America was founded to protect religious and spiritual freedom. 
We have said that the righteousness that will bless a nation is the promotion of Israel. We prayed this. God promised Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. We said the righteousness that will exalt a nation is the promotion of the Lord Jesus. And we finished last week with, let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is he, the Lord of lords. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. That's the Bible. That's not Ron Bailey talking. That's the scriptures that are settled in heaven forever. Hallelujah. My text for today is found, and you won't want to put this up on the screen yet, but it's found in this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Before I get to this text, ah, uh, because when I get there, I'm going to have to admit that I preach to you out of being convicted. That's a hard thing for me to do to pray for those that, you know, are persecuting me and to love my enemies. So I'll just tip you off to that. But I want to give some reflections. All of these things are reflections. This past Thursday, I tuned in again for an hour Zoom meeting that is held every two weeks by Pacific Justice Institute. That Zoom meeting is managed by Brad Dacus. And this past Thursday, there were over 100 pastors from all over the state of California. By the way, I, you see my tag? You see my tag? I know I'm not supposed to move, but the, you see? I voted, I voted, hallelujah, I voted. Do you know that last election, especially presidential election, over 25 million evangelicals did not vote? That is terrible and tragic. That is not right and not good. But I am glad to tell you that through the function and operation of the pastor liaison with uh, Pacific Justice Institute, just in California through churches, over 100,000 new people have been registered to vote in California. Praise God. Hallelujah. But what I'm about to tell you is tough. You see, one of the key roles of a pastor is to be the shepherd. And the shepherd's responsibility 
is to protect the flock. In the old symbolism, shepherds at night would gather all the sheep into the sheepfold. And then the shepherd would lay down across the gate. I have tried to not be political, but to be biblical. And I'm about to make the most political statements that I've made in this, in this whole series. I wonder how many of you are familiar with something that passed the House of Representatives this last year. It's called the Equality Act. Now, I can't look through the camera and see any people that are raising their hands, but I wonder how many in this room, by a show of hands, have any familiarity with what the Equality Act is. I think I see two or three hands raised. The Equality Act that passed the House of Representatives this year, but was defeated in the Senate, had many implications. One of the implications that it has, and I'll read a statement from Pacific Justice Institute, so you'll probably hear this statement again. But one of the things that the Equality Act would do would be to replace the religious or reverse the Religious Freedom Act. Now, probably most of you don't know what the Religious Freedom Act is, but basically it says that we are entitled to carry out our deeply held religious beliefs and that we cannot be jailed or fined or whatever else if we are sticking to our deeply held religious beliefs. By the way, I wrote this in an email to both Brad Dacus and the Chief Counsel of Pacific Justice Institute, Kevin Snyder, who has argued cases before the Supreme Court. Here's the statement. In the opinion of Pacific Justice Institute, if the Democrats win the presidency and take the Senate, the Equality Act already passed in the House of Representatives but blocked in the Senate, would pass. All Democrats running for the Senate are in favor of the Equality Act. If passed, the Equality Act would reverse the Religious Freedom Act and would deny churches the opportunity to terminate staff that are acting in a biblically immoral manner. I don't say this as a threat. I don't say this to pick a party, positively or negatively. But as the shepherd of this church, I want you to understand what is at risk, what the stakes are. Our religious freedom on which our nation was founded is under direct, constant, and increasing attack, not by people but by principalities and powers and darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's at risk. That's why I'm going to end this with, we got to pray. We got to pull down strongholds. 
Nobody should be threatened or intimidated or done anything nasty to. But you and I need to wake up, read the Bible, know what's going on, and take a stand for righteousness. Do you know that this year in the state of California, the legislature passed laws that said if an adult has sex with a minor and there is 10 years or less difference in age between the adult and the minor, there is no crime. That's the legislation from hell. And I'm passionate about it. I'm not angry. Yeah, I'm angry about it. I'm angry because it's done, and it's not right, and it's not healthy, and it's the kind of sin that's going to condemn this nation instead of righteousness exalting a nation. It doesn't matter what party. In California, I'm sure Republicans agreed with the Democrats to pass it. I'll really get political. Express your opinion at the ballot box. Go vote, and vote your Bible, not your feelings. Now I'm going to go back to continuing the statement from Pacific Justice Institute in the opinion of Pacific Justice Institute. If Supreme Court packing takes place, it would destroy the U.S. economically as it would make the Supreme Court reflective of Congress. Who wants to invest in countries that don't operate under the rule of law that can change by popular demand? That's the opinion of Pacific Just Justice Institute and Brad Dacus. And when I wrote this to Kevin Snyder, he said that's a fair representation of what Brad Dacus said. I want to add to this. I went over this, by the way, with, with the board members. We had a meeting yesterday, and I was greatly encouraged, and I want this congregation to know that this church has a wonderful board, wonderful wonderful leaders that are men of God and, and men of prayer, and I thank them. They are a phenomenal support to me. And when I read this to one of them, he said, yeah, we wouldn't have three branches of government. We'd only have two. There would never, ever be an independent judiciary ever again. I almost want to say, Wake up and smell the roses, but I really want to say, wake up, read your Bible, and read the positions so you know what you're voting on. Now, I know we're all concerned. Whether you're on the right or the left, I hear it from both sides, so do you. This is the most important election that we've ever had. Well, I've got to tell you something. Whoever wins, the president and the country need a healthy church. Whoever wins, the mission of this fellowship, of which this church is a part of, remains evangelism number one. Worship number two, discipleship number three, and compassion number four. That's not going to change no matter who wins. We are going to be strong in the Lord. A divided nation is discouraging, but a divided church is devastating. It's the 
truly dedicated followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the hope of the church. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's exalt the name of the Lord our God. Let's bring men and women to Christ. Let's worship him. And let's make disciples, not just converts, fully dedicated, knowledgeable, into the word disciples. And then let's have compassion getting ready to say this, and I had no knowledge till I walked into church this morning and somebody whispered in my ear about having foster care for three new kids at 5.30 this morning. That's godly compassion. And that's the kind of compassion we need. It's the kind of compassion we need that we're going to use our parking lot to help unwed mothers and, and give pregnancy exams and encourage pregnant women to keep their babies. And we're going to distribute gifts to them so that children can be brought up and nurtured in, in the fear and in the wisdom of God. That's compassion. It's why four, five times a week we give without cost we let the Merced County Food Bank operate out of our uh, uh, event center. And they're here four or five times a week. We let them come in. We don't charge them anything. It's amazing how many people are here. Why? Because we are a compassionate church. That mission is going to stay the same. I'm going to run out of time. I don't want anybody listening to me, whether it's today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday. I know I'm passionate. When I get passionate, I get loud. I, I know. I'm really not mad at anybody. But you know, the Bible says in our text... For today, our text, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What America needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little of. 1 John 4, 16 to 18. And so we know and rely on the love of God for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, our culture has one definition of love. Somebody will really get after me for saying that. For some, love just means you get the hots for somebody. I know that doesn't sound very pastoral, but that's the most <laughs> succinct way to say it. If you want a real definition of love, get your brain into 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. Love is gracious, etc. Remember again, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That means against persons, against people, but against spiritual wickedness in high places and principalities and powers. And that those phrases just mean ideas, 
and philosophies, and as I mentioned earlier, even legislation. The Bible says, pray for those who persecute you. The church, and by the church, I don't mean the organized church. I mean the church mystical. The fully dedicated followers of Jesus have always been persecuted by the world. By the world, I mean the unregenerated system. Jesus said, they hate me, and they're going to hate you too. I want to get this up on the screen because we're going to hike up our prayer. Now that we can meet together, instead of just having phone tag at 6 o'clock on Thursday morning, we'll still have that. I'm going to be here on Thursday morning. Open the doors at 6 o'clock. And anybody that wants to can come. You can pray 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. I'll be here from 6 to 7. If you can't make it, still text me, you know. And uh, you can sign up on the thing. It's, it's there on the screen, nbschurch.com forward slash Thursday prayer. You know... Praying for those who persecute us is a matter of reward. The Bible says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, I'm going to end with this uh, illustration because I want to make sure we have enough time to have our final song and then come back and give you the final blessing and though it won't be next Sunday the America in crisis I'm going to give you an outline next Sunday on how to pray well pray for peace we need to pray for peace Violence is stirring. Unrest is stirring. Pray for safety. Go read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Pray for unity, especially unity in the church. A divided nation is difficult, but a divided church is disastrous. Pray for justice. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And finally, pray for spiritual revival. My brothers and sisters, we need God. We need an anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need a downpour of the rain of heaven. We need an anointing that comes from above. We need a resistance to the forces of violence and evil and hatred. We need, we need a revival of purity. We need a revival of life. It only comes from above. It only comes from God. Let's fall on our faces if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I know the plans that I have for you, says Jeremiah, to give you a hope and a future. That's our promise. Reach out, claim it. Let's pray and let's seek the face of God. Lord, I pray for your anointing. I pray for your blessing and I thank you for the opportunity to worship.